So uh, good morning, Title I coordinators. Thanks for joining us for the September Title I webinar. I'm Erin Suddeth. I'm the branch manager of the Title I Part A Support and Improvement Branch. Um, and as I just mentioned, but I think we've had some more people join us. Uh, if you haven't already done so, please go ahead and check that your mic is muted and that your camera is turned off. And um, that's just going to allow everybody participating to focus on the presentation. And if you're not super familiar with Teams, um, those controls are located at the top right hand side of the Teams window. Um, as always, we will have time for questions at the end of the presentation. So you can um, send, put those in the chat. If you want to um, use the raise hand feature and then come off mute and ask your question, you can do that too. And you can email anything uh, to me at erin.suddeth at education.ky.gov. As always, we will post the uh, recording on our documents and resources webpage. Be sure that you check out last month's webinar if you weren't able to join. I was actually out of the office, but I was watching along with you. Um, and Erica, who is one of our Title I consultants, talked about planning and documenting purposeful parent and family engagement activities. This information is very timely for the beginning of the school year, and I strongly recommend sharing it with your Title I building principals as well. It's important to make sure that Title I funded events meet the intent and purpose of the Title I program and that they're documented properly. I know that we've mentioned in several previous webinars that parent and family engagement is a very common area for findings during monitoring. So the information that Erica shared during last month's webinar can really help prevent some of those findings. So be sure to uh, check that out. So for today's agenda, we're going to, um, as always, have some reminders. We'll uh, review our September newsletter topics in case you uh, missed any of those. Then we will talk about the GMAP user access administrator role, as well as paraeducator qualification requirements. And our main focus is going to be on the comparability report because it is that time of year. So our reminders, um, remember any district wishing to request a carryover waiver for school year 22-23 funds needs to do that by September 30th, um, and that is done by emailing David Malanti. And the information that needs to be included in that email is listed in the August Title I newsletter. I actually think it might be in the September one as well. Um, we've covered that in several recent newsletters and webinars, so I'm not going to um, review all of those details again. So you received an email from me last week, or maybe you saw it in the Commissioner's Monday message about Kentucky's ESSA waiver request being approved by the U.S. Department of Education. So this means that the requirement that limits KDE's ability to grant that 15% carry carryover waiver only once every three years has been waived for school year 22-23 funds. That's Project J. That means that districts who have requested and received a carryover waiver within the last three years may request another one for Project J if needed. Now, it's important um, to remember that you still need to follow the carryover waiver request process that I mentioned that's outlined in our newsletter, the email that goes to David. Um, you still need to do that in order to be granted a waiver. Our next reminder is be sure that you're carefully reviewing any comments left by consultants on your GMAP consolidated checklist. And this is not just Title I, but all of the other programs that are part of the consolidated application. Um, be sure that you are reviewing those prior to resubmitting any revisions. So if your application is returned by KDE as not approved, all of the pages where there are any identified issues have been noted by KDE consultants on that consolidated checklist. And we've also gone in and we've added some little narratives on what the issue was and how you can address it. So carefully reviewing those comments just helps ensure that you address all of the issues and it really increases the likelihood that the application will not have to be returned again. The checklist can be accessed um, in GMAP. If you're on the sections page at the very bottom, there's a link for the consolidated checklist. 
Each year, we work to make our application review process stronger and more consistent, and that's just part of our commitment to continuous improvement. Uh, we also may receive additional guidance or clarification on um, an expenditure or some form of allowability throughout the year, and we really strive to communicate those updates to you in a timely fashion. Our goal is to make sure that all of our districts are in compliance with all laws, regulations, and guidance, and that you have all the tools and technical assistance you need to run effective programs. Uh, we have been seeing a lot of requests to purchase uh, some items like calendars and agendas, and I just wanted to remind everybody that after further analysis and conversation, uh, we determined that these would no longer be approved. We um, shared this in the January webinar and stated that it would be going into effect beginning with the 23-24 uh, school year. And this was because those items um, do not meet program intent. So if you missed that January webinar, it is still available on our webpage uh, to check out. And don't forget to check the status of all open applications in GMAP. There's definitely more than one. Um, be sure to address any remaining issues identified by KDE and resubmit if your application is not in approved status. And the status should be KDE Consolidated Consultant Approved. Our September newsletter is linked on the PowerPoint that I sent you. It's also posted on our web page. We had a lot of information in September's newsletter. Uh, we had a reminder about the carryover waiver. Another reminder about re reviewing GMAP application feedback. Our annual announcement about the comparability report. We had some information about parent and family engagement in private schools, as well as some of those required parent notifications that uh, you should be sending at the beginning of the school year. We had an announcement about the newly updated new Title I coordinator training webinar and PowerPoint that are posted on the web page. Uh, we had our uh, not annual, maybe biannual reminder about keeping your district's contacts up to date in person role manager to make sure that the appropriate people are receiving all program related communications from KDE. And we also had um, some information about Medicaid renewal and sharing that with families. And that was on behalf of the Kentucky Cabinet for Health and Family Services. So if you're not currently subscribed to the newsletter, you can do that um, directly in the newsletter. There's a link or you can just reach out to me and I will add you to the list. Don't forget to share any pertinent articles with Title I principals or other staff who help with Title I, such as a homeless liaison, foster care point of contact, finance officer, et cetera. You don't have to be a Title I coordinator to subscribe to the newsletter, so we can get anybody added uh, who would like to be. So we'll get into our new information. Up first is GMAP User Access Administrator. So as always, the new school year brings about staffing changes. And as staff are hired or retire, maybe change some of their roles and responsibilities, it's important to make sure that the roles assigned within GMAP are accurate. The roles within GMAP determine that user's permission set, what they're able to do within the application. Anyone who is assigned the role of user access administrator, that is the only person with the ability to add new users, modify existing users, and inactivate former users for your districts. Now, these roles are not job titles. Um, like I said, they just determine what each user is able to do within the system, such as making edits to an application or approval rights. Uh, Title I consultants and the other consultants here at KDE who review your application do not have the ability to go in and make these changes to different roles for you. To review all of the roles that have been assigned in your district, you can click on the address book that's on the, the main navigation menu in GMAP on the left hand side and that will list all of the different roles and who has been assigned to them. There's also the GMAP Training User Access Role Manual. That is under the GMAP Planning Tool Training section on the KDE Resources page in GMAP. And again, that KDE Resources page is in that uh, main navigation menu. We do recommend that districts assign more than one person as user access administrator. 
And this just ensures that the district retains the ability to update users in the event of staffing changes. We've definitely had it happen where the one person who is assigned that role leaves and then uh, districts need help getting someone else in those roles. So be sure to check your address book and make sure that the individuals who are assigned to different roles are still working in the district. Those roles still apply to them. And in the event that your district only has one user access administrator and that person is no longer with the district, uh, go ahead and reach out to your Title I consultant and we'll forward that information along to the appropriate party so that uh, you can get in there and, and assign some roles in GMAP. Our May and July newsletters included some articles with information and reminders surrounding paraeducator qualifications, and I just wanted to review those uh, here. And uh, please note that the terms paraprofessional and paraeducator are used interchangeably. So a paraeducator or paraprofessional is someone who provides instructional support under the direct supervision of a certified teacher. 34 CFR 200.58 of Edgar outlines the required qualifications for paraeducators who are working in Title I programs. All paraeducators must have earned a secondary school diploma or its recognized equivalent. And when we say paraeducators who are working in Title I programs, um, Title I programs or programs supported with Title I funds, we are referring to all instructional paraeducators working in school-wide programs, which is the majority of our Title I schools, and paraeducators who are paid either fully or partially with Title I funds in targeted assistance programs or private schools being served under Title I. So in addition to a high school diploma or its equivalent, paraeducators who were hired after January 1st of 2002 working in a program supported with Title I Part A funds must have some additional uh, qualification requirements. These requirements were introduced under No Child Left Behind, and when the uh, Elementary and Secondary Education Act, or ESEA, was reauthorized by ESSA in 2015, these requirements did not change. So let's look at those. One option for the additional education requirement is that the instructional paraeducator has completed at least two years of study at an institution of higher education. Two years of study is going to be defined by that institution of higher education. So, for example, that may mean 12 credit hours per semester for a total of 48 credit hours, while at others it may mean 15 credit hours per semester for a total of 60 credit hours. It just depends on how that particular college or university defines full time. Uh, someone can also meet this additional requirement by obtaining an associate's degree or higher or uh, having met a rigorous standard of quality and being able to demonstrate through a formal state or local academic assessment that they have knowledge of and the ability to assist in instructing reading or language arts, writing or mathematics, or reading readiness, writing readiness, and mathematics re readiness. Kentucky currently uses the Kentucky Paraeducator Assessment or KPA to meet that last requirement. So note that a secondary school diploma or its recognized equivalent is necessary, but that is not sufficient to meet the requirements for paraeducators working in Title I programs. And paraeducators hired before January 1st of 2002 were required to meet these qualifications no later than January 8th of 2006. So there should not be any instructional paraeducators working in uh, a program supported with Title I funds who don't meet these requirements. Districts are responsible for ensuring that paraeducators working in programs supported with Title I funds meet the requirements. So that may involve having seen a transcript with the number of credit hours or a diploma or uh, a passing score on that KPA. Now, schools are responsible for ensuring that paraeducators work under the supervision of a certified teacher and that any non-instructional duties that they've been assigned, like bus duty, cafeteria monitoring, things like that, um, are proportionate to the non-instructional duties of non-Title I paraeducators. Some ways you could document that would be a schedule of what the 
a paraeducator does each day and or a list of their duties. And you can visit the paraeducator requirements in Title I Schools webpage for additional information and resources. So now we're going to move on to the main focus of today's webinar, which is the comparability report. Section 1118C of ESSA requires that districts demonstrate that services provided in Title I served schools are comparable to those provided in non-Title I schools prior to the expenditure of Title I funds. And services funded through state and local funds should be comparable between um, Title I and non-Title I schools. Now, if all of the schools in a particular grade span are being served with Title I, then instead of comparing Title I schools to non-Title I schools, we have to compare our higher poverty Title I schools to our lower poverty uh, Title I schools to ensure comparability. Kentucky districts complete the comparability report workbook every October and upload it into GMAT for approval. The uh, comparability report is always due on or around November 1st, so this year it's going to be due on November 1st. Comparability can be calculated one of two ways. We have student to staff ratios. That's the method that the majority of our districts opt to use. And then the other is a school to school salary comparison. Um, and typically our districts only use that in the event that they can't demonstrate comparability through the student to staff ratios. There are some exclusions, some scenarios where comparability won't actually have to be calculated. This is going to be for our districts with only one school per grade span or our districts with only one school. Or if no schools are served in a particular grade span, for example, if you don't serve any of your high schools or any of your middle schools, then comparability does not have to be calculated for that grade span. It would still need to be calculated for the grade spans with uh, Title I served schools. All districts, regard, regardless of whether or not they meet any of those exclusions, must submit the comparability report in GMAP. Now, our districts who are not required to actually calculate comparability will only complete the first page of the workbook. They won't actually go in and put in that um, student to staff ratio or salary comparison data. And we have several resources to support you in the completion of the report available on our documents and resources webpage. We'll talk about where to download the report itself on the next slide, but our available resources include the checklist, which allows you to see what your KDE consultant uses when they are reviewing and approving your report. We also have a very detailed comparability report guide with a lot of um, screenshots and instructions on completing the report and a training video that walks you through completing the report. The video is about 25 minutes long. It might be beneficial to have your comparability report open on one screen and either the guide or the video open on another screen so you can kind of pause and refer to that when you need to. The 2023-24 comparability report template is available in the GMAP district documents library. So you'll get to the district document library from that main navigation menu. Make sure that you're in the right school year. You will click edit documents and then you'll click the document template link. And uh, this is also where you're going to upload your completed report. When you download the report, be sure to save it with our naming convention. We always put the school year, the name of the district, and then the abbreviation comp rep. Be sure that you are using the template for the current school year. We do update it every year to make sure that all of the dates are correct. So you want to be sure that you're using the right one. And we ask that you do not complete the checklist tab of the workbook. As I mentioned a minute ago, that is for KDE consultants to use when they're reviewing and approving your report. And there is that PDF copy of the checklist on our Title I webpage that you can use as a reference. So you can just leave that particular page of the spreadsheet blank. These are some of our common comparability report issues. I've also linked the uh, guidebook and reference page numbers where you can see more information on these issues and how to address them. 
very first thing is when you open that uh, Excel workbook, and it might take a minute for it to open, it's a very big uh, document, be sure that at the top you click Enable Macros. This allows the various functions and equations and kind of behind the scenes stuff uh, built into the report to work properly. You also want to make sure that you are grouping your schools correctly, both by grade level and by size. Now, if a district doesn't have any schools with overlapping grade spans, the grouping by grade is pretty straightforward. You probably have K through 5, 6 through 8, 9 through 12. In the event that you do have overlapping grade spans, uh, you need to look at which groups share the most grade levels in common. So for example, let's say that a district has some K through five schools and some six through eight schools, but one K through six school. Well, we would group that K through six school with the K through five schools because they share the most grades in common. We wouldn't make another group just for K through six. Schools uh, may also be grouped by enrollment size, um, small or large. There's no set number that constitutes small versus large. The rule of thumb is if the largest school has two times the enrollment of the smallest school, that's how we differentiate between small and large. Now for all of the schools that fall between the largest and smallest, the districts are, are going to place those in the size grouping that they deem most appropriate. But you also want to be sure that you are consistent in this. For example, you might have a cutoff point. If it's less than blank students, it's going to go in small. If it's more, it's going to go in large. Now, please note that your groupings may be different than the previous year based on changes in your enrollment. That's something that I think we ran into last year. So don't just open up last year's report and put everything in the exact same place because it, it may have changed. Be sure that you include the correct staff. The full-time equivalency or FTE staff counts uh, should be for state and locally funded instructional staff members, as well as those who assist or supervise instructional staff members assigned to each school. Now, if you have itinerant staff who work at multiple schools, you need to prorate them, meaning you determine the FTE for each school and include that um, for them. Now, you are not going to include non-instructional staff on this. So, any clerical staff, um, your cafeteria workers, your janitorial staff, they will not be included. You also won't include any instructional staff who are being paid with federal funds or the portion or FTE that they're being paid for with federal funds, such as Title I Part A. Now on page nine of the guide, you will see a, a list of staff who may be excluded from the comparability report. Now, whether you opt to include these staff or exclude them, be sure that you are being consistent across all of the schools. And in some instances, as I mentioned um, a moment ago, our Title I schools are going to be compared to non-Title I schools if all of the schools in the grade span are being served with Title I. Uh, in this scenario, you would want to make sure that you refer to the poverty ranking of the schools within your GMAP application on the school eligibility page. This is the page that your consultant will check to verify that schools have been grouped by poverty accordingly. So what do you need to do if a school or schools um, aren't comparable? First up is double check your numbers. Ensure that you've counted the correct students and staff. Uh, for example, preschool students should not be included in enrollment counts, so make sure that you haven't included your preschoolers. Another option would be try using another date. You have basically an entire month to choose from. The comparability report data has to be taken from the last day of the second month of school to October 31st. Um, so for most people, this is going to be around September 30th, or for us, I guess it'll be September 29th, since that's the last school day of the second month. A second month is defined as 20 teaching days. So it's not unusual for people to have to check multiple dates to find one that works for the comparability report. So if you start working on your report next week, but you can't find a date that works, don't panic. You have the rest of October to find one that works. I just recommend, you know, checking every couple of days or every day until you find one that works. 
You could also choose to calculate comparability using the school to school salary ratio or comparison rather than that student to staff ratio. And as always, if you're having trouble, you can contact your KDE consultant and we will um, provide you with some assistance. As far as what you should not do if schools aren't comparable, the first one is going to be put the school in a different or essentially inaccurate grade level or size grouping. So you have to adhere to those grouping requirements outlined in the guide. Schools with the same grade spans must be grouped together and schools with overlapping grade spans must be placed in the group of schools with which they have the most grades in common. And again, large schools are going to be roughly double the enrollment of small schools. And don't change which staff are excluded at various schools. For example, um, if the EL teacher or any staff paid for excess costs of providing services to children with disabilities are being either counted or excluded at one school, then that means that they should be counted or excluded at all the schools. You can't um, pick and choose. 2 CFR 200.334 of the Uniform Grant Guidance requires that records pertaining to a federal award be saved for three years. Uh, we talk frequently about program documentation um, in our newsletter and our webinars and things. So Uniform Grant Guidance requires you re to retain these records for three years. Now, if you were with us during the statewide federal programs training in June, you may remember the attorneys from the Brewman Group strongly recommending that you save records for five years. KDE also recommends saving records for five years as a best practice. In the event that your district is selected for monitoring, you'll be required to provide KDE with the following documentation to verify that your comparability report data was accurate. So at first is going to be the infinite campus enrollment summary reports for all of your schools. Now the date on the reports must match the date used to determine comparability. The school enrollment numbers on the reports must match the numbers on the comparability report. I recommend that you um, print and file away or uh, download whatever version of those reports you used when when creating them. That way, if there's maybe some changes, someone enrolls or unenrolls later in the day and you go to pull that at a later date, you don't have an issue of those not matching. We would also need to see staffing lists for all schools. These lists should clearly document the full-time equivalency or FTE of state and locally funded instructional staff at each school. In the event that the district is selected for monitoring, KDE staff should be able to easily locate the staffing data which aligns with the data on the comparability report. And of course, you are going to need to remove any personally identifiable information or PII from that, such as staff names or addresses. Now on the next slide, I have an example staffing documentation table, and there is a similar table that's also provided in that comparability guide. So this is just an example of how to document the staff reported on the comparability report. It's pretty basic. We've got the position listed on the left and the total number of individuals. Then we have a column for state and local FTE and a total at the bottom, and then a column for federal FTE and a total at the bottom. So um, each district's HR office is going to probably have their own way of uh, documenting all of the staffing and um, it might be a very confusing looking spreadsheet for those of us who are not familiar with it. It can be kind of difficult to understand. Um, so that is one issue with just providing that spreadsheet as documentation. Another potential issue with just sending that HR spreadsheet that they use is a lot of times there is going to be some of that PII on there, names, addresses, phone numbers, things like that. So um, more of a summary similar to the table that's on the screen. Uh, that's just a much easier way um, for us to be able to read that. And it doesn't contain any PII. It's perfectly safe. Um, so we can see that each position that is being counted um, and what their title is. So we know that only instructional staff were counted. We can also clearly identify the FTE of state and locally funded staff. So you don't have to use something like this, but it is an option. 
You may also consider developing a process in your district that includes uh, working with your HR office to take data from their big uh, master spreadsheet and summarize it using something uh, similar to this. Now, a written process for comparability isn't required, but it would help ensure consistency and enable others to complete the comparability report in the event of staffing changes or maybe some sort of emergency where the Title I coordinator um, is not available. That process could also be submitted to KDE during monitoring and possibly identified as a best practice. Okay, so that's going to wrap up our webinar. So I'm going to check and see if we have any questions. And I see that we do. Um, how do we get an update on the status of our consolidated application? You can just uh, go into GMAP and see the status. If you've submitted it and it still says district superintendent approved, that means that KDE is in the process of approving that. Um, just a couple of reminders that we do review applications in the order in which they are submitted. And there are um, a lot of different programs probably reviewing your application. And I think Title I has the most staff of those programs. So for some of the others, it, it might just be, you know, three or two or even one person reviewing all of those applications. So it might take them a little bit longer. And it always, I think, takes a little bit longer on that first submission because we are looking at everything from scratch as opposed to revisions where we can kind of focus in on a couple of pages. OK, um, on last year's worksheet, grades band D was listed as P through eight, which is the one we use this year. D is blank. I think that um, the the grade spans on that very first sheet, you can go in and change those. So I think they default to, you know, K5, 6, 8, 9 through 12. Um, you can go in and change those. If you have K8 schools, change that to K8 or, or whatever. There are, I believe, eight different possible um, grade spans that you can have. Okay, I don't see any more questions in the chat. And if that still didn't make sense or you're still having an issue, just um, reach out to your consultant. And I'll check the email really quickly. Okay. Doesn't look like I have any uh, questions on email. All right, we only have three webinars left for the rest of 2023, which feels crazy. So our next one is going to be Thursday, October 26th from 10 to 11 a.m. Eastern time. Be sure to mark that on your calendar. And I always like to remind you that we do value your feedback and we want to learn about what you find helpful, what types of um, content you'd like to see us include in webinars and newsletters and things. You can submit those through our anonymous webinar feedback survey, which was in the email you received about uh, this webinar, or you can always just email me or your consultant. That's fine, too. And OK, last check for questions. I don't see any. So uh, thank you for joining us this morning. Have a great day.